You, um, you feel good? And remarkably, the answer might actually be yes. That's the goal. You might want to live long, but even more important, you want to live well. Well, like many people standing on the stage before you today, I too have written a book. Now, I was not the kind of person that always had this burning desire to write a book, but in mid-2016, I was called by a very charismatic and persuasive woman, Jeanne Rickmans, who went on to become my literary agent, and she wanted me to pitch a book idea to her. So we met over coffee, and I was like, look, I don't really have an idea. And she said, oh, forget about that. Tell me what you have ever written that an audience has really resonated with. And I said, oh, well, that's easy. The previous year, I had written this article for uh, a neuroscience blog with the ABC, taking a look at this experience of women going through menopause and what they call brain fog, firstly pointing out, ladies, this is not the first sign of Alzheimer's and dementia, but also looking at that, yes, hormones play a role, but each woman's experience of menopause is influenced by her physical health and by how much stress she's experiencing and her social connection networks. So, menopause, said Jeanne, there's your book idea. And I was like, I'm 40, I'm not quite sure I have the experience. That's something mum once did with her friends. And then she said, oh, okay, what about baby brain? And I was like, I'm a Kiwi. We do pregnant prime ministers. We don't do baby brain. <laughs> N equals two. <laughs> but then I had this sort of moment of realization as we were having that conversation that I was the owner and operator of a female's body and brain, had been my entire life. I had been working as a neuroscientist for a good 25 years, and I had never really before considered how experiences I've had as a female with pill and puberty and periods and pregnancy, all of these might interact and sculpt and shape how I think and how I feel. So like a very good first-time author, I scurried off home and I started writing out my chapter outline, which essentially was a long list of questions that I didn't know the answers to. Really thinking that this was going to be a book about the primary sculptor of our brains, hormones. So one of the first questions I set out to ask was, I was very interested in how hormones influence how we feel and our emotions. So that I'll take a look at this PMS, PMT, that kind of cranky, moody phase many women say they experience before they get their periods. So I came across a really interesting meta-analysis, which you may know is kind of a, a pool of research studies, all, all, all pulled together to help increase the kind of information we can get from that. And it reported that globally about 50% of women say yes, they get moody before their periods. But what was really interesting is if you went to France and Switzerland, 10% of women put their hands up and say, yeah, I get a bit moody. All the way over to Iran, where 95% of women do. I thought, well, isn't that weird? If we've all got this hormonal experience, why are our emotions varying so widely based on the society or culture that we live in? So I turned to the research of another Kiwi called Sarah, Sarah Romans, who is a women's health psychiatrist. And she too was really curious about this propensity women have to blame their emotional state on their hormonal status. So she designed a very clever study and women were, were given a, a phone app and it popped up every day and they had to put in the day of their menstrual cycle, how they were feeling, they were given positive and negative and neutral emotions to choose from. They had to talk about how stressed they were feeling, their physical health, their social connection networks and tellingly the women were not told that this was a study looking at PMS. And so she crunched all of the data and many, many hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of menstrual cycles and they found only one in 20 women showed any clear variation of her emotions based on her hormonal status. And so I was talking to Sarah about this and I said, well, is this denying women's lived experiences? Surely is, is this data right? She said, it's very, very interesting to look at what did influence women's emotions, more so than hormones in most of these women. It was either their physical health, how stressed they were, or how socially supported they felt. So as Sarah pointed out, they were probably far more likely to be pissed off their husbands didn't take the bins out than the fact that their periods were coming. 
data changed significantly when the women were told the study was on PMS. So there is another point in the lifespan where we have this tendency to blame hormones for things going wrong, and that is when young people go through puberty. This study I came across writing the book was very interesting. It looked at a child experiencing pubertal hormones for the first time. So you might have a, a, a girl who's maybe nine, enters puberty far earlier than her friends. She is more vulnerable to emotional turmoil and stress than a little girl who goes through the same age or later than her friends. Something very different happens with boys. A little boy who goes through puberty earlier than his friends, what happens? He gets taller, bigger, hairier, his voice drops, he gets musclier, and he rises in social status in his friend group, and he is protected against emotional storm and stress compared to the boy who goes through puberty later than his friends, that little guy. So you've got different children here, all experiencing pubertal hormones for the first time, but in a different social context. Now, there is one point in the lifespan I read about where hormones do play a large role in sculpting our brains. Now, when we go through a pregnancy, ladies, we receive a dose of estrogen a thousandfold more than we get the entire rest of our lifespan. If we look to the animal kingdom, to pregnant mammals, to females, who don't read books on what to expect when they're expecting, we see that that dose of estrogen, that pregnancy makes them smarter, it enhances their cognition, and it protects their brain health for the lifespan. Now, in this particular study, women were brought into the lab and an fMRI was done on their brains, which takes an image of the structure of their brains. And then they went away, they fell pregnant, and an MRI was done on their brains after their first pregnancy to see the influence of pregnancy hormones. And every woman, the same region of her brain, changed structure. And that was the part of the brain involved with social cognition, with empathy, with thinking how other people might think and feel. So when I was writing this particular part of the book, researching for that, I went to stay with my own mum. Now, I grew up in Christchurch, New Zealand, which is where my mum still lives, which sadly is a city in the world that no longer requires very much introduction. Now, my mum's retired, and she volunteers in a particular primary school. It's kind of like the class Nan, and she's helping out with this particular group of kids moving through the school system who need extra support. Now, this group of children were all born between the years of 2009 in 2011. They were all under the age of two when the Christchurch earthquakes first came and shattered the city. Now, these children were going through this phase of, of great brain plasticity, and, and that's a, it's a really great thing, because it's a prime time to learn, but it also comes with this double-edged sword. There's this great vulnerability. So their brains were developing right at that time when they were living in this incredibly stressed and unpredictable world. So there is a researcher in New Zealand in Christchurch called Kathleen Liberty I went and visited, and she has been looking at what happens when children start school, when they're age five and they, they're new entrants into the school system in New Zealand. And she was looking at this particular cohort of kids, and she found out that those kids who were under the age of two during the earthquakes, 21% of them were entering the school system with signs of post-traumatic stress disorder. And they need people like my mum to come in and be the class nan. <clears throat> now, it's really interesting because Kathleen Liberty has found that there are a particular group of kids within this cohort who are protected against the signs of post-traumatic stress disorder. And these are children who have grown up in the Māori community in Christchurch. And they think, Liberty and other Kiwi researchers think perhaps it's the, the, the kind of the, the collective dynamics, that wonderful sense of extended family, or whānau, as we call it in New Zealand, that's protected this particular group of kids right when their brains were most vulnerable. Now, on March 15th this year, on a Friday morning, four of my best friends from growing up as a, as a kid in Christchurch got on a plane, waved goodbye to their, their children who were going off to school and also the climate change march that was happening in Christchurch and all around the world at the time, and they flew over here to Sydney to have a, a lovely weekend way with me on the beach, and it rained all weekend, but they got off, off the plane in Sydney, opened up their mobile phones to find 
text messages from their children and from their children's schools saying that the Christchurch, the entire city, had gone into lockdown. Now, many of us know exactly what happened on that terrible, terrible day in March this year. And now, my friends eventually kind of found their way to my house, and then I watched in absolute awe as they deployed the tactics that they had learned raising children through the earthquakes to help them deal with this awful, awful massacre that had happened in Christchurch. And of course, the rest of the world saw how a city and a country responded. Here was a city and a country responding using the skills that they had learned. They kind of knew what to do. They understood that the greatest vulnerabilities and the greatest opportunities that we have when we're protecting people is the power of other people. And it's probably no coincidence that images like this were spread across the, the, the news media. Now a lot of people think that the haka is something that the All Blacks do or it's like a war dance. But it's a way for girls, for women and men and boys to come together as a group and to channel what might be really difficult or overwhelming emotions and show respect and support and cohesiveness with other people. Now, I'm, I'm not a believer in fate or, or anything like that, and that's not what this is about. But I do wonder on reflection if what happened in that terrible, terrible day in Christchurch earlier this year, maybe it happened in a place where people kind of knew what to do they had learned through the years of the earthquake trauma what needed to be done to help people, to protect people's emotions, to build people up, and to build that stress resilience. Now, it's probably quite fitting that, I don't know if there's any Kiwis in the audience, we say it's world famous in New Zealand as a Māori proverb, and it goes like this. He aha te manui o te ao. What is the most important thing in the world? Hatangata, hatangata, hatangata. It is the people, the people, the people. And I think the people of Christchurch realise that. And rather, unlike me, when I started writing my book, where I thought I was writing a book about how biology shaped our brains, I learned through researching the book and through what was happening in my hometown, that is the people, the people, the people that truly shape our brains. <laughs>